Good morning again. Please, please continue finishing your breakfast, but I thought we should probably get started with the program. If you're an old timer, you know these slides can go a little bit long. And we certainly don't want to make anyone late for the sessions. I want to again welcome everyone to Anaheim for the 2013 AMATIC Conference. And we will recognize a number of people who had major roles in making all of this happen. First, I'd, though, I'd like to uh, express AMATIC's appreciation to all of our publishing colleagues who have supported us. Two publishers have shown their support by becoming AMATIC corporate partners. I mentioned them uh, in the opening session. I would like to invite a representative from Hawks Learning Systems, Abby McBride, to come to the stage. everyone. I'll keep this short and sweet for you, I promise. Um, on behalf of Hawks Learning Systems, I just wanted to express our sincere appreciation and say thank you to AMATIC, um, to the board, and to all of you for allowing us to be part of such a wonderful organization and um, an enlightening event here. At Hawks, we feel both honored and proud to partner with you as corporate sponsors, not only to support the organization and this event in particular, but also just to work with each and every one of you towards our, our common goal of improving student success in mathematics. Um, again, I'd like to thank you so much for your time. I hope you've enjoyed Anaheim as much as we have, and we look forward to seeing you next year in Nashville. Thank you. Our second corporate partner is McGraw-Hill, and I would like to introduce their representative with us this morning, Alex Gay. Good morning. Well, again, uh, we'd like to express our gratitude for, uh, for working with us through the course of this uh, meeting. It's been a really fantastic meeting so far with so many great ideas that have been shared by all of you with regards how you can reimagine uh, teaching mathematics for greater student success. But I'm going to pose a challenge to you all. Um, as, uh, as we get the opportunity to engage with you at our booth and at our focus groups, we get to hear all of these ideas from different colleges around the country. And we try as often as possible to share those ideas with the rest of you. There are about 1,400 of the greatest minds in mathematics here. And I encourage you all to share your ideas amongst each other and really try and push each other forward to try and have a greater common success. Whatever role that we can play in that, we're happy to play. And I look forward in Nashville to hearing a lot of ideas that have been spread and, uh, and the successes that have come on the back of it. So thank you all. You've seen the conference and you know how much work is involved in putting one of these things on but there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes all year with a lot of really dedicated people to making AMATIC the organization that it is and will continue to be. So I would like to show you some of the people who we classify as the AMATIC leadership. Uh, I would ask you to hold your applause until I ask you to recognize different groups. I know you have your favorite coordinator access people and I know you have your favorite committee chair or your favorite VP, but just contain yourselves. <laughs> oh. My term as AMATIC president will end in a couple of months. Uh, some people have told me it's going to end on Sunday, but no, with the new bylaws, the president continues on after the conference until the end of the year. But these last two years have been very exciting for me. 
I've gotten to know a lot of people. I've traveled around the country, as I said, on Thursday. But it has been a great experience because of the people that I have had an opportunity to work with. And I'd like to thank my board for their support over the last two years. First, Nancy Shatler, who is currently the president-elect, and Rob Farinelli, who I have known for probably 20 years all through the board as current past president. Two other national officers are Margie Hobbs, our current treasurer, and Mary Beth Orange, uh, secretary. We have eight regions, and there is a proper order to the regions. <laughs> all right? We do it geographically. So in the Northeast, Jane Tanner. Mid-Atlantic, Chris Allgaier. Uh, Southeast, Annette Cook. Midwest, Jim Hamm. Nicole Lang is the Vice President for the Central Region. Kate Kozak is the VP for the Southwest Region. Uh, see, I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> Those fan clubs out there. Stefan Barato, and I believe I spelled both first and last names correctly, <laughs> are as VP for the Northwest, and Bruce Yoshiwara is the West VP. <laughs> now, now those, uh, see, wait till my picture gets up there, then I want to hear some cheering. <laughs> now those are the elected officers on a national level, but you have elected other leaders that assist AMATIC on the state and regional level. So I'd like all the affiliate presidents that are in the room to stand up and let's recognize all of our elected leaders. <laughs> affiliate presidents. <laughs> Behind the scenes, I'm sure you're all aware that we have an office at Southwest Tennessee Community, Community College in Memphis, Tennessee. Most of the work of the organization directly interacting with members happens through that group. And that team is led by our interim executive director, Cheryl Cleves, and our great office staff, made up of Christy Hunsaker, director of finance, Christine Schott, Director of Publications, and Beverly Vance, the office, man or our office coordinator. Uh, Beverly, you might have missed this year, there, she had an accident just a week before she was supposed to come to Anaheim, so she couldn't join us. She's back in Memphis. I'm getting emails at least two, three times a day. So even as she's resting, she is working. The guy in the middle, is our newest addition to the office staff. Uh, we've had four office staff people for a number of years and then one person left and for the last two years we've been making do with temp help. Uh, the new addition is Rio Davis and he is classified as a technical clerk but he is going to be handling or assisting the others with a lot of the technology involved in uh, managing AMATIC. So thank you Cheryl, Beverly, Christine, Christy, and Rio. <laughs> AMATIC has nine academic committees. They're, they met yesterday. You might have been to their committee meetings. I hope you did. But you might have been to their themed sessions. They are very crucial to the organization. I'd like to introduce you to the nine academic committee chairs. Linda Zentek is division chair for developmental math. She, she and her committee are responsible for the position statement dealing with intermediate algebra. Sean Simpson is the chair of the division department issues committee. Fred Feldon organized the Ignite event last night and is chair of innovative teaching and learning. Ned Shello is math for AAS program. Sandy Poinsett is math intensive. Mary DeHart is chair of the statistics committee. April Strom was the one who organized the Wednesday night pre-conference event on research. Kendall Jacobs is chair of the uh, teacher prep committee. 
and Beth Edmonds is currently chair of the Placement and Assessment Committee. Would you recognize their work for the organization? <laughs> the Academic Committee chairs are sort of out front. Those are the people you see in sessions, but there are a number of other people who make things happen. Behind the scenes, we have Peter Georgiakis. Um, two years ago, I believe Rob gave him a presidential award, and in his presentation, he talked about the union of the set of lawyers and the set of community college math instructors. Peter is in there. He may be the only person in that intersection, but he is in there. Uh, every contract that we have to sign goes through to Peter first for his input. Steve Wilson corrects my grammar, my punctuation, my spelling, and the errors that are all over that might crop up in our position statements and our publications. Kathy Mowers, a past AMATIC president, is our liaison to Mu Alpha Theta. Kathy also couldn't be with us this year, but she's planning to join us in uh, Nashville. Russell, Russell Simmons is our historian who we have really begun to rely on as we make preparations for our 40th conference in Nashville. John Pazdar is our grants coordinator. Working with John has been a unique experience. I think we've submitted a number of grants over the last year, but he has come up with, gosh, a half a dozen different ideas that I, the board is trying to uh, you know, organize and bring forward to you. Publications. You get the AMATIC News. That is now uh, managed at, by Daniela Long as the editor. And if you've noticed the new website, much of the work connected with the new website was done by our Midwest VP, Jim Hamm. But George Hurlbert must have converted hundreds and hundreds of pages from the old site to the new. Mathematic Educator. The editor now is David Tanner. The production manager is George Alexander. Professional development. If you've uh, participated in one of our webinars, they are organized by the committee chairs, but with the organizational assistance of Johnny Oates. And if <laughs> an access fellow. <laughs> and Ana Herman Hermana Jimenez, is the coordinator for traveling workshop. Not another one for her? She's access too. All right. The AMATIC Foundation has four at-large members in addition to Rob Farinelli, uh, myself, Margie Hobbs, and Jane Tanner. The four at-large members are Ellen Angel, Rachel Black, Pat McKeague, and Bill Stinkin, the winner of our presidential award on Thursday. Will you help me in recognizing their assistance? <laughs> there, are, pardon? Patience. <laughs> I don't think I've forgotten anybody. We just got to build, build. All right. Uh, I hope you have had an opportunity to stop by the foundation table and make a donation. One of the prizes is a three-year membership for AMATIC. And if you made a donation while you were in Anaheim or before you came to Anaheim, even the people who donated online are in this drawing, you should be in that drum behind me. So now I'm going to go to and draw the winner of the three-year membership. John Savage. John, if you'd stop by the foundation table after breakfast sometime today, 
We'll get all the information we need. Okay. Many of you are Student Math League moderators. Would you please stand? Student Math League moderators. The Student Math League is coordinated by Susan Tricklin, and those tests that are written are done by Steve Glasper. So Susan, Steve, where's Steve? Today's the day that Steve decides to be shy. <laughs> uh, the SML process is a year-long endeavor with many people working in the background to make the process run as smoothly as possible. Uh, please join me in recognizing the women in the national office who take on the ordering of the plaques and books for the conference and the registration. Those are Christine, Christy, and even though she's not here, let's have a nice round of applause for those and Beverly Van. <laughs> the members of the Test Development Committee under the leadership of our Steve Glassberg work on creating new and exciting questions for the upcoming rounds. Let's have a round of applause for these hardworking people. <laughs> Um, he already recognized them, but each participating school has a local moderator who is responsible for giving and grading the exams. So since you've already applauded for them, I'll skip to the next program. Uh, we gave regional and some national awards yesterday at the lunches, but always have some special awards to give out today. The first one is the Glenn Smith Team Award, which goes to the top scoring team from the previous year's round. This year, the Glenn Smith Team Award goes to West Valley College, and accepting the award on their behalf is Rebecca Wong. top student scorer this year, I know you heard this on Thursday, but scored a perfect 40 points in both rounds combined. I don't believe I've ever seen that happen, have you? Um, that student is Stephen Howe from West Valley College, and accepting on his behalf is Rebecca Wong. Each year, Pearson generally awards, generously awards a scholarship to the top scoring eligible student. Maureen O'Connor from Pearson is here today to make that special award. Thank you, Susan, and good morning. The winner is Kim Yu Kim from Highline Community College, and he is attending the University of Minnesota. Thank you. for the plexiglass award, please. <laughs> uh, when both rounds are completed, there's still work to do. We have generous sponsors who make other special awards in the summer. Kay Weiss from U Alpha Theta sends a student version of, this year she sent Mathematica, uh, to the top scoring student in each of the eight regions. Also, the Association of Women in Mathematics gives a certificate and a one-year membership in the AWM to the top scoring female in every region. So let's have a round of applause for those sponsors. <laughs> and now what you've all been waiting for. <clears throat> Yesterday, excuse me. <clears throat> yeah, look at it, you guys. 
Yesterday, the faculty math league test was given to a crowded room of 49 participants. As always, we like to first recognize TJ Duda, who has taken this test nine out of the 10 times that it's been given. I call him the Cal Ripken of, <laughs> of the faculty math league. So a round of applause for TJ. This year we had a tie for second place. And the second place winners are Aisha Arroyo from Mazazoet and Aaron Levin from Holyoke, both from the Northeast region. So if they, <laughs> if they could stand, we could give them a round of applause. Uh, the first place winner this year is Curtis Mitchell from Kirkwood in the Central Region. <laughs> Curtis, if you could see me afterwards, um, we have a choice of prizes for you this year. Uh, Kay Weiss from U Alpha Theta always donates something for the winner of the Faculty Math League. She was hesitant to get another TI Inspire because it's gone to the same person uh, two years in a row. So we'll talk about what you can expect as your award. And now, what the VPs have been waiting for, the coveted plexiglass statue. And I noticed this year it's up here. Usually it's at the table where they can sort of fight over giving it up and, and taking it back. But you may suspect already that the coveted plexiglass statue, which is awarded to the highest faculty math league team each year, goes to Jane Tanner from the Northeast region. Come on up. Maybe it should go to Ernie Danforth, Jane. I don't usually do this, but last but not least, I want to give very special thanks to Steve Glassberg for writing all those tests, including the Faculty Math League test. Although Steve has retired from teaching, he continues to play this very special role for AMATIC. Please join me in thanking Steve for all the work that he has done. if I do that one. All right, I, as I said, and you've heard in your regional meetings, next year we will be meeting in Nashville, and it's a very special year. It's our 40th conference, so we're going to do a lot of uh, partying in Nashville, but the only way we could have gotten here through 40 years is by the leadership of a long line of, oh, no, I'm out of place. Hold that thought. I have a slide with all the past presidents on it, so I don't have to bring that up. But Laura comes first, just like you guys asked. Laura Watkins is coordinator of the Access Program. All right, guys, will the Access Fellows please can stand? Carl cohorts one through ten. As I said, next year is our 40th conference. It will also be the 10th cohort second year. So we will have completed 10 cohorts in Nashville. So we're planning to have a little reunion for Access Fellows so you can get back together and exchange what has happened to you over the 10 years while the rest of us sort of engage about the last 40. <laughs> All right, as promised, we wouldn't have gotten here without some of these people working a lot. Um, and we hope to have many of them with us in Nashville. So Sister Clarice, 
Herb Gross will be the keynote speaker in Nashville, and you can see the rest of the list. We even added Farinelli on that already, getting ready to go. But I'd like the, the past presidents that are present to please stand and be recognized and thanked for your help. We've looked at my board, the committee chairs, the people who are coordinating our publications, our professional development, but we are here at a fantastic conference, and there's a special team that makes that happen. So here is our conference team, led by Kevin Doctor as conference coordinator, with the assistance of Honey Kirk as assistant conference coordinator, Louise Olshan, our advertising chair, and if you've been to the exhibits, it's the work of Frank Goulart, exhibits chair. Presiders, Darlene Whittington, who was trying to rope in more people to preside at the very last minute because of travel problems and cancellations. So help her as we get ready for Nashville because you can complete those presider forms online. Started yesterday. Linda Kadama is, is our roommate network director. She's the one who handles roommates for that single person at a camp campus who's coming to the conference and would like to save a little money. She's the one who makes connections for roommates. And the program. The program coordinator first time this year is Judy Williams and she has a fantastic team of people who help her plan the program. In addition to the academic committee chairs, she has Ernie Danforth, James or Rob Eby, Eric Hutchinson, Marjorie, Amy. They have done an excellent job on this conference, on the past conferences, and they are accepting your proposal to present in Nashville. Please recognize their work. Now we come to the people in the blue shirts. The blue shirts with the little Mobius strip on it, not the blue shirts that say, y'all, come on, come on. All right, so first, Carol Murphy, come on up. We appoint the local events coordinator years before the conference, and they work with the conference coordinators over the three years leading up to there. So Carol has worked on not only her own conference in Anaheim, but the past two conferences as well to learn what's involved. And I got here, it was about oh, 6.40 this morning, and her crew was already in this ballroom putting out all the things on every table. And they were even adjusting the little oranges so the logo faced out instead of on. So I want to thank Carol for all of her work. I'd like to uh, thank my committee who's worked behind the scenes and especially during the conference to make the hospitality room uh, run, be there to greet you, all right, set up for um, today's uh, breakfast. I really wanna thank you, please stand up. Okay. I um, I'd also like to take a few seconds here if I could read the names of the winners of our little contest. All right, so um, I picked the, for the ghoulish guessing game, I picked the four closest. Someone um, was only five items away. So that was um, Bruzan Affiette, right? And then the three others are Jerry Chen, Miriam Pack, and Liz Bronagel. Right, and then um, for the one where you had to do a calculation, the equation, we had uh, two winners, Peter Aviary and Allison Schubert. Oh, I, we had three winners, I'm sorry, and Tom a, um, Adlet. And then we had two winners for the Mobius. All right, uh, Sup Supawan King and Mark Dahl. 
All right. So I want to thank all of you who did participate and put in your um, your guesses. All right, and um, congratulations, winners. Um, uh, come by the hospitality suite about 11:15. We we need to um, coordinate a few of the gifts, and so we'll have them ready for you. All right. Thank you. As I said, people or local events coordinators work as a team leading up to their conferences so that you all come folk under the direction of Tim Britt has been in the background helping and working with these folks so that they can put on uh, as good a conference as we've had in Anaheim. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. David Matsunaga was born and raised in beautiful Hawaii, but left after high school for the mainland USA to study math, plant physiology, Russian linguistics, and architecture at Northwestern and Harvard universities. He has numerous national awards for his work in math, math education, and was the youngest person to be awarded the Presidential Award for Excellence in Mathematics Education by then President Ronald Reagan in 1985. I first met David when he presented at an NCTM conference. He was on their board. And he presented a talk on Pi, which I found very entertaining and very informative. He had some activities that he used that I think he's going to tell you about that I have used when we got to Pi Day. Uh, at my college, Pi Day is a big event. Last time, I, or two years ago, I spent an entire evening baking pies for Pi Day. Uh huh. Uh, I think Pearson had the buttons back then about Pi, and there was one with a shoe, a fly, and the number Pi. Right. Anyone know what that meant? Exactly. I had a colleague who didn't know what that was. So we had to find YouTube with Dinah Shore shoe fly pie and apple pan dowdy. So I made, made shoe fly pie for the first time and last, by the way. <laughs> and that was inspired by David. David's interests has been diverse. They include research in modeling convex polytypes and playing the oboe professionally twice playing in Carnegie, Carnegie Hall. This diversity is also demonstrated in some of the talks he's given in the past, like slime versus men's fashion. A contradiction. Question mark. The mathematical mysteries of the US $1 bill, with ha which had a little origami in it. Join me in welcoming David Matsunaga, who will get us started in counting down to Ma March 14th, 2014, which is only, if you haven't done the math yet, 132 days away. David. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, as Jim said, I'm from Hawaii, so let's see if you know the correct uh, response to the following prompt. Aloha. Aloha. Excellent. We're all set for a AMATIC conference in Hawaii, right? How about that one? Yeah. <laughs> take notes, Jim. Okay. Okay, let me let me take this um let me take this jacket off. You know, sometimes Mathematics is just really kind of hard work here, okay, okay. So, um, as Jim said, I'm from Hawaii, so number one, get to know me. No. <laughs> and number two, I'd like, to, um, uh, I'd like to say how grateful I am to AMATIC for this unique opportunity to share in AMATIC's Math Fun Fest this year. I teach in grades seven through 12, mathematics. Um, I, so since I work 
exclusively with teenagers all day. I'd also like to thank A. Maddox for this rare opportunity for me to interact with adults all day. <laughs> so looking at, the, um, uh, looking at the screen, here's the introductory screen. It's only blah, blah, days until Pi Day. I don't know if some of you recognize this. This is actually the sixth Catalan number, and um, it is for you to calculate out. Um, one of the reasons why I chose this particular expression for, um, for the number is, right up here, is that this number involves pi in a, also another, uh, another way, using the, using the product symbol up here. So pi appears in many, many places. Here's the product symbol up here. It appears in certain animals when they're on the couch. Okay. Okay. And so let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at this. So first of all, I'd like to extend out an, a warm aloha from my fellow colleagues in the Pacific Islands Mathematical Association of Two-Year Colleges. or Pi-matic, okay? okay? Okay. Now, just a quick review of what we're looking at here. The ratios of corresponding um, for, for circles, since all circles are similar, they're all the same shape, no matter how big or how small they are, the ratios of corresponding lengths don't change. So therefore, the, the ratio of the circumference to the diameter doesn't change. So that is a constant, and that's a constant that's a little bit bigger than three, a constant that we call pi. So, since the circumference to the diameter is this fixed ratio called pi, by multiplying both sides by diameter, you get circumference equals pi times the diameter. So the circumference is just a little bit more than three times the diameter. Now using this fact, you can find some very, very interesting things all over the place. Some of you folks remember when tennis balls used to come in a metal can. If you have one of these, cherish the metal can because uh, you realize that there are three stacked tennis balls in the metal can here, okay? And since there are three stacked balls, we have three diameters high, and the, the, the um, circumference of the can is pi times the diameter, right? So actually, in reality, the can's height is approximately the same as the, the circumference around the can which is very, very non-intuitive. If you were to ask a student, uh, what's the relationship between the height of this can and, um, you know, and the circumference around? It's very, very non-intuitive, even for adults as well, too. Now, um, these cans are not available anymore, but what about other items? Is there a similar relationship with a Pringles can, for example? Or how about the Arizona teas, or anything that comes in cylinders like this? So that's a good thing that you could, you could um, uh, find out. Yesterday, Mark Dugopolsky had a wonderful presentation about um, the application of circles, and he also pointed out the fact that the tennis balls take up exactly two-thirds of the volume, and the negative space is one-third of the volume. Again, something that's very, very non-intuitive as well. So where does the symbol pi come from? Well, it was reportedly first used by William Jones in 1706, uh, but was popular after it was adopted by Leonard Euler in 1737. By the way, six years ago, we celebrated his 300th anniversary. Euler was born about a month after Pi Day. Uh, you can remember Euler's birthday because it falls on tax dates on April 15th, okay? Um, pi, what about Pi? Pi for, for, for the word periphery or peripheros, okay? And that kind of makes sense. Now, you know that, uh, especially at the school level, uh, three and one seventh is a popular rational approximation that's used for Pi, especially in the elementary school. But what about this three and one seventh thing? Since pi is, since pi is approximately 3.14159265359999 so on, okay? How close does three and a seventh get to pi? Okay, well three and a seventh since it's rational is gonna be a repeating decimal. And so you can see what's happening here. We have 3.14857142857142857. And that means you have only accuracy unto the hundredth decimal place, right? To the four. Right over here is to the four over here on this side, okay? Um, in the fifth century AD, the Chinese mathematician Zhu Zhongji, okay, came up with this approximation instead, 355 over 113. 
what about this 355 over 113 thing? Is this a better rational approximation of pi? Let's, let's take a look at this. This is approximately 3.14159292, et cetera. So it's much more, uh, much more close to pi. In fact, we're close to the millionth decimal place right here with the nine, okay? And actually, this is the approximation for pi that I want all of my students to memorize because it's actually pretty easy. If you think of doing this, okay, first of all, have students draw the fraction bar, okay? Start underneath the fraction bar and just think of the first three odd numbers, then you'll go one, one, three, three, five, five. Okay, from the bottom, one, one, three, three, five, five. Start from the bottom and go one, one, three, three, five, five. Okay, <laughs> of course, you know, the, uh, the thing that a lot of students will do is one, one, three, three, five, five, and they'll go, they'll go from the top to the bottom, of course. <laughs> okay, <laughs> now, uh, let's take a look at a, a continued fraction, I mean a, a, um, a continued fraction approximation of pi, okay? And so you can see where the three and a seventh is coming from. It's just right here. That iteration is way over here at the top, okay? 355 over 113 comes through here. And at this point, you're getting a very, very good approximation of pi, okay? Close enough for government work. Our government anyway. Okay, okay. Where do these um where do these actual approximations for pi come from? Well, I know a lot of you folks are are acquainted with all of these different um, infinite series that approximate pi, the Magava series, the Wallace product, and the Wallace product when multiplied by two gives you pi. But these are actually not good enough to uh, to use on computers because they converge so slowly. Uh, I'm reminded of this Dilbert cartoon. Gilbert here is at this large supercomputer, and he says, I spent my entire fortune to buy this supercomputer. And Dogbert says, what does it do? Gilbert says, it can calculate the value of pi to about a jillion decimal places. Okay. And to that, he says, a lot of people talk about the areas of circles, but I'm doing something about it. Okay. So what about world's record for, for jillions of places of pi? Okay, well, let's take a look at this, the world's record, which is verified for the number of calculated digits of pi, five trillion digits by Alexander Lee and Shigeru Kondo. This, this took 90 days ending on August 3rd, 2010. And the formula that they use to, for convergence for this is this Chudnovsky formula. Now, some of you folks have heard about this Indiana Pi Bill. The bill through the 1897 General Assembly of Indiana um, was to establish actually a method of squaring the circle. It wasn't directly, it didn't directly establish the value of pi through legislation. What it was all about was a method of, of squaring the circle so that you had, so that it dictated various incorrect values of pi such as 3.2. And the bill never became a law because uh, a mathematics professor who happened to be present in the legislature uh, said something's wrong with this, okay? Now, so you might laugh about this, the Indiana Pie Bill, ha, 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 okay? But I have to tell you that um, according to Hawaii state statutes, we're not too much better off. I'll give you an example. Uh, if you see a white Toyota Corolla in Hawaii like this, then uh, look closely at the license plate, okay, which is my license plate. <laughs> okay. Okay. And I don't know if you know it, but you know, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, especially in Japan, you'll see people flashing the peace symbol when they take, you know, pictures and stuff, okay? I'm not actually flashing the peace symbol, I'm just adding an extra digit of pi <laughs> to the license plate, okay? 3.141592. So as you see, the state of Hawaii only recognizes five decimal places of pi, okay? okay. Now, I don't know if you, you saw this a little bit, uh, saw this in the other slide as well too, but it took a heck of a time to find a matching parking space number as well. Now, side light, since we're taking a look at number patterns anyway, this is, this is a side light, it's not really about pi, but um, let's take a look at something that's kind of interesting here. 
after the three, we have one, one, four, one, five, right? Okay, 3.1415 for the expansion of pi. Let's take a look at just the 14 and 15 because something, something very interesting struck me about the Marriott's in Anaheim. Did you know that the Marriott's in Anaheim do not have a numbered 13 floor? It's floor 14, right? Okay, so there is a 13th floor, it's just numbered floor 14. This is a building in uh, Honolulu coming up. And if you take a look at the sides, you will see uh, on the sides, this is the, um, this is the construction access. Usually there is on the side of buildings, a special um, elevator, a special lift for construction workers. Uh, the, what happens with this lift is that there are wooden boards and spray painted with the numbers of the, um, the floors on the side of them, right? Okay. So let's take a look at a close up of this. I thought this struck me as kind of interesting. The numbers go from 1 to 10, 11, 12, 15, 16. So it's evident that as floor 13 used to be hard for realtors to sell, so is floor 14 now. So mathematically speaking, I guess it looks like 15 is the new 14. <laughs> and of course, 14 is the old 13. <laughs> okay. If we were to have this AMATIC meeting in Hawaii, you'll also see very, very close to the convention center, the Waikiki Landmark Building, which, yeah. <laughs> which we favorably know as our pie building in town, okay. Here's an interesting graph. This is a graph of uh, world record memorizers of pi and when those records did occur over time, the number of digits is vertically, it's going vertically and the year horizontally. So you can see um, this is, th there's some people that are really getting serious really quickly in the past few years. The world's record is Chao Lu. He did on November 20th, 2005, he recited 67,890 digits of pi in 24 hours and four minutes. <laughs> he is holding his Guinness World Record certification. He actually had 100,000 digits memorized, but at the 67,891st place, he made a mistake, and that was it already, okay? Right. Now, National Public Radio on March 14, 2007 had a very, very interesting feature on Pi Day, and they interviewed Mark Umile, who still has the North American record on reciting Pi. On July 21st, 2007, he recited 15,314 digits of Pi. He took three hours and 14 minutes. All very, very suspect, I must say. <laughs> yeah. okay. So on the air on National Public Radio, he actually did a recitation, a sh uh, recitation of, of Pi shortly, and uh, let's take a look and see. You'll notice in his recitation, and, and for most of these people who do recite and memorize Pi, they group these things in, um, in, uh, in patterns so that you they can go into some kind of cadence while they're reciting this. So see if you can follow along here. Let's see if this works. 3.141592653589793253843283275102884197163993757 
That's 41 dozen digits of pi in a million in a minute and a half. Okay, well that takes a minute. Okay, uh, let's see. There have been claimed 30 million digits by this Ukrainian neurosurgeon and Professor Andrei Sucharchuk on June 17, 2009. It's not certified, but what they did was they went to random places in pi and they said start here, and then he could he could um, go off on a string at any random place. But this is this is as yet uncertified, okay? Here's one thing that you can do in preparation for Pi Day, uh, in preparation for March 14. This is something that I composed for a colleague of mine, Kathleen Goto. Kathleen is very, very active in, um, in mathematics activities with College Board. She's written a number of College Board exam questions for the BC and AB calculus. And here's something I wrote about her. Mrs. K. Goto, a great pedagogue, of course, makes one grasp profound polyhedra, elusive equations, and oh, the calculus. Each phrase is roused with her now infamous fun pi numeral mnemonics. Never zero in accuracy, facility, even a precision formula, A equals principle, and sequences involving the endless Euler E. And the last part actually refers to something she was talking about in class of the convergence of the, um, of, uh, compound, the compound interest formula. But does anybody notice something about this? Yeah, the hint is there's only one period in this entire thing. It's right after the misses. It's right here. Let's see here. Go right after. That's the only period. I had to use every other type of punctuation because the period's only used in one place. So the number of letters, <laughs> right? So the number of letters is the mnemonic of pi, right? The number of letters in each word, three, one, four, one, five, nine, two, six, five, and so on. But maybe you're wondering about this. What happens when you have a, what happens when you have zero in the expansion of pi, okay? Zero in the expansion of pi actually doesn't come about until the 33rd place. So what happened here to accommodate the zero? I, I, I actually used the word zero. Yeah, I actually ended up using the word zero, okay? Um, another colleague came up to me and said, um, uh, remind me to uh, ask you uh, when, you got when, you're gonna, when you're gonna get through with this, okay? Okay, okay. Now, Talking about occurrences, for example, zero and pi doesn't come till the 33rd place. Here are some other strange occurrences of pi. For example, the sequence, uh, this particular sequence, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, first appears at the 17,387,594,880th place. Okay? Okay? And the reverse sequence, 9876 0, first appears at the 21,981,633rd place. Okay? Aside from the beginning, the sequence 314159 first appears at the 176,451st place, okay? Now, one of the kind of interesting things you could do, which really shows you some number patterns here, is the following. Some of you folks are, interested, are, are familiar with electronics. Uh, when you look at resistor codes of tiny little slashes that are put on resistors, there is an actual coding from zero through nine, zero being black, one being brown, and so this is, this is well known if you do electronics. Okay, so what we've done in class is we've taken beads of these colors and here you can see my rascal seniors beginning to string beads which are the actual expansion of pi. And by doing this you can actually find out, wow, here are six blues in a row or here are, you know, here's where our school colors are and, and so on. This is down a very, very, very long hallway, so we have several hundred feet of pi already in beads, in colored beads as well. Now, talking about strings of numbers again, going back to strings of numbers, okay? Here is 
our president, Barack Obama, is President Obama in Pai. Here's a picture of him in Hawaii. Uh, I guess he was born in the city of Kenya, Hawaii or something, okay? Uh, okay. And that happened on August 4th, 1961, or 841961. Is, per, is Barack Obama in Pai? And yes, okay, beginning the 373,646th place, okay? If you want to know whether you are in Pi, there is actually a website. It's called Am I in Pi? <laughs> Go to that website, okay? Type in your birthday and it will tell you where you are in Pi, okay? Okay? Now, uh, let's see. What, uh, what zip codes are closest to Pi, okay? Well, the zip code that would. Here's one that I found for Sonico Recycling, okay? These zip codes are gonna be in Savannah, Georgia. The zip code here, you can see it's 31415-9605. Not too bit bad, right? 31415-9, okay, that's pretty good, okay? A uh, little bit down the street is the Savannah Architectural Supply Company, 314159 and 608. So up to 314159 at least, right? And so there is, by the way, a giant food store, a market right around the corner that you might want to check out because at that store, you could probably find yourself, okay, some king size M&Ms. Here is our, here is the plain M&Ms king size. Do you notice anything about the plain M&Ms king size? Right here. That's right, 3.14 ounces, okay? Approximately pi ounces. Wasn't that a wonderful thing that the Mars candy bar did for us? <laughs> and, and actually have their plain king size M&Ms be pie ounces. So I was in a candy store once and I said, well, you know, uh, this is kind of interesting. I stumbled on this by accident. Is there anything um, special about any of the other M&Ms? Uh, M&Ms is a great candy for pie day anyway since it's round, okay, and it's ellipsoid. You can have all of these different cross sections which are circles. Uh, what about the peanut size? Well, this is 3.27, not even close to pi, you may think, okay? <laughs> but I guess the Mars company had uh, something else in mind because this really is a um, function of pi. It's actually the natural log of eight pi squared over three ounces. <laughs> okay. So I thought on my quest, I'd take a look at the other M&Ms as well too, okay? M&M's plain regular size, 1.69 ounces. Well, that's not even pi, close to pi over two. Pi over two is about 1.57, this is 1.69, okay? But wait, there's more, okay? This is equal to the square root of one half plus three pi over four ounces, okay? M&M's peanut, regular size, 1.74 ounces. Again, not even close to even half pi but it really still is a function of pi, and you can see these things are getting a little bit more and more complicated. This is the cube root of nine times the quantity e plus pi all over 10 ounces, okay? Now, we've lived, you and I have lived with those four types of M&Ms for a, quite a long while, then they started adding new flavors like peanut butter, 1.63 ounces, and of course, I guess the Mars company had to be a little bit more, you know, abstruse with their, uh, with their function of pi in these particular flavors because this is equal to the tangent of pi times the quantity five <laughs> e plus pi over four ounces, okay? And one of the newest flavors is almond 1.31 ounces, and of course you could guess if this is still a function of pi, but um, in a very, very subtle way, okay? <laughs> look, infinite summation, look at that. Isn't that amazing, okay? So I have homework for you, okay? This is a dark chocolate M&M's homework. How many pi ounces in the dark chocolate M&M's, okay? Now, I've asked my students, you know, can you find other things that do have pi or functions of pi in them in the supermarket, anything that's on a printed label, anything? Um, it's not easy to find. I'll just tell you that, that straight off the bat. But one of the students did find a nor savory soup uh, cream of vegetable, which is 3.14 ounces. And, um, and you can look in the grocery store for things like this. You know, my students have asked me on occasion, is this the kind of thing that like mathematicians do? 
do they like, do they like go to the grocery store and look for pie and stuff? And so I tell them, yeah, that's what they do all day. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to become a professional mathematician? And they said, yeah, that sounds pretty cool, you know? So I'd just like to tell you, I'm trying to do my part in pushing people into the profession, okay? okay? Now, would you believe it that up to now, there has been no Pi Pi Pan, okay? Um, this is a very recent Kickstarter project, um, and you can find this online by a guy named Pinojo, okay? And it's just being produced now, the Pi Pi Pan, okay? So you can see examples, and you might be able to get one before uh, March 14th next year. Um, as Jim said, he's made a lot of pies for pie day. Uh, here is a pie for pie day. It has the digits on it, okay? So you think, okay, well, this is, this is a contrived pie, pie. But I want you all to realize that all pies, edible pies, all pies are related to pie. How? Well, okay, so here is 3.14, okay, our, our approximation for pi. If you reflect this over the y-axis, <laughs> so all pies are part of pi, okay? <laughs> Including pizza pies. So let's take a look at a very special pizza pie from the Chicago area. I know, I know some of you folks come from the Chicago area. You're familiar with Giordano's deep dish pizza. It is a stuffed pizza. It is, um, it is, it's a wonderful pizza. And it's a great pizza because it is basically cylindrical. And with cylinders, uh, let's take a look at this. This is the radius of the cylinder. This is the height of the cylinder here. And volumes of cylinders will, will be pi r squared times h, right? The area of the base times the height, the area of the base is pi r squared, multiply that by the height, okay? Let's take a closer look at this Giordano's deep dish pizza, okay? With this, um, with this in mind as well too. So here's the volume again, okay? And there's nothing, to, there's nothing to limit us from calling the height H. We could easily call the height A for altitude, of course. And instead of the radius being R, let's call the radius Z. Why Z? Uh, because it stands for the radius, okay? So, <laughs> volume of this cylinder will be pi times Z squared A. Pi z squared <laughs> a smiley face okay so I want you I want you to know that pizza is the only food whose name is the formula for its volume <laughs> okay now if you're at Giordano's Pizza or if you're at any restaurant for that matter I'd like you to check your next restaurant bill because if it ends in 86 cents, you can do this. <laughs> also, check to make sure that your bill, uh, check to see if your bill comes out to be $27.31. If your bill comes out to be $27.31, by adding a 15% tip of $4.10, you can come out with a total of $31.41, 10 pi, okay? While you're paying that tip, okay, I want you to take a look at your dollar bill because uh, your dollar bill may be, may be a, what's called a pi note. And here is a dollar bill whose serial number comes close to pi. Now I've been collecting these for years <laughs> and this is as close as I've ever come. Not even 3141. This is, this is as close as I've ever come. So I'm always on the watch and always on the lookout for pie notes, okay? Speaking of notes, okay, here's a man who was replete with lots of notes, the very famous and talented pianist Vladimir Horowitz. Horowitz is playing here at his Steinway piano. This is the piano that Horowitz kept in his New York townhouse. He used it in recitals and recordings from 1974 to 1981, and also from 1985 and uh, all the way to 1987. There was actually a pulley outside of the townhouse to get the piano up and down outside the window. 
And uh, the great thing and the interesting thing is, like, what does Horowitz have to do with Pi? Well, it's not really Horowitz. It's Horowitz's piano, okay? And this is it. That's the, that's the sine wave serial number 314. So approximately 100 Pi, right? Okay. Going up the coast, if we go up to Portland, Oregon, I know some of you folks are from beautiful, beautiful state of Oregon, okay? I made a pilgrimage to Washington Park in Portland, Oregon, uh, because it is not only a beautiful park, but the, um, but the um, light rail station at Washington Park has something very unusual in it. It has this, um, this granite wall which, uh, which is on which is mounted a very, very large core sample through Washington Park. There are these scientific formulas tracing the, the state, the, the accomplishments of man and all this kind of thing. And on one part of this station, carved in granite, okay, here we go, okay, which is really quite amazing. So I had to go and take a look at this. Why? Because the first line, 3.14159265235 is okay, and the rest of it's wrong. <laughs> All the rest of it is incorrect, okay? Now okay. uh, this, is, this is carved in stone now, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Mathematics carved in stone. So what's going on here? Okay, let's take a look at the expansion of pi. Here's the expansion of pi grouped in, term in, grouped in tens, okay? So here, are, they're grouped in ten. So the first hundred, the next hundred, the next hundred, the next hundred, the next hundred, and I think a lot of you have already anticipated it. That's the part that was engraved by the engraver. Okay. Plus a little bit more, just to make sure. You know, we'll we'll give them a little bit more for their money. So he added just a little bit more at the very very end. So the first ten digits are correct, and then places 200 to, um, to 210 and 300 to 310 and so forth. They're all correct, but, uh, but no, it didn't occur to anybody that, uh, or certainly to the engraver, that uh, the order mattered at all, okay? <laughs> you laugh, okay? Here is a workbook, okay? For grade six through eight, it's called a piece of pie. All of these different activities you could use for Pi Day and so on. Okay, and there's the Pi and there's the expansion. 314-159-265-389-3793. And uh, folks, the uh, string of numbers 893793 doesn't appear into the 687,486 place of Pi. Okay, so obviously uh, the artist that did this particular rendering for the cover thought, well, you know, after the first few, uh, they're just making it up, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, just, just add anything, you know, that's, that's, that's whatever's, okay? Okay, okay next, um, let's see. Notable birthdays on Pi Day are the following, okay? You have a whole bunch of very famous people, including musicians like George Lee Tel Telemann and um, Les Brown as well, Les Brown of his band of renowns. Einstein, of course, is the most famous birthday on Pi Day. Einstein was born in 1879. But also for us mathematicians, Sierpinski was also born on Pi Day in 1882. Yoshizawa, the famous origami grandmaster, was born in 1911. And Hank Ketchum, famous for Dennis the Menace, okay, born in 1920. We have two very famous astronauts born on Pi Day, both Frank Borman and Eugene Cernan. Um, the actor Michael Caine, as well as Billy Crystal, they're all Pi Day birthdays that you can celebrate next March 14th. Notable events on Pi Day include the following, okay? Eli Whitney patents the, pat the cotton gin. Uh, the operetta Mikado uh, had its premiere. Uh, let's see, Xavier Cugat and his orchestra record Babalu, okay? And Hank Aaron did his, did his homer in his first exhibition game. Will Chamberlain set the NBA playoff record for 53 points and Gorbachev become president of the Soviet Congress, okay? Now, were there, by any chance, any notable events on Super Pi Day? Super Pi Day being 3141592, okay? March 14th, 1592. And the answer, nope. Okay. Okay. Here's a factoid, okay? Does your institution do this? 
MIT mails application decisions on Pi Day at exactly tau time, i.e. 6.28 p.m., okay? Now, I know some of you folks are, are tau proponents, tau being the better number to use than pi, tau being 6.28, but I, I, I am not because June 28th does not fall in our school year, so I'm still a pi kind of guy, okay? Okay. Now, let's take a look at this, okay? Epic Pi Day is coming in two years, okay? So Epic Pi Day is March 14th, 2015, 31415, ignoring the, the two zero, okay? So 31415 is coming soon. It'll be here before you know it. I actually have a student whose great-grandmother was born on the last Epic Pi Day, March 14th, 1915, and she celebrated her 98th birthday this past spring, and she's still going strong. So, so there you have it, in a couple of years she'll be 100, okay? So this talk, I felt, is, is a great talk, not just for your students, not just for yourself, okay? Not just to be fun, okay? But also for your family as well, too. Why do I say that? Because for an epic pie baby born on March 14th, 2015, okay? Um, and I know some of you in here might be able to make it. Maybe some of your daughters, maybe some of your granddaughters, okay? Use Nagley's rule, 266 days from conception of birth, okay? <laughs> That's what you're aiming for. Okay, okay. You might want to take this down. Okay. 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 So, so now you see in front of you, okay, now everybody sees in front of you, you all. Uh, do you have a card with a hole in it? Okay. And you also have a pie pencil that, that I got for you. Okay. Uh, the pencil has an expansion of pi on it. <laughs> the hilarious thing about the pencil is the more you use it, the less it's a pi. <laughs> so, and then you see a, a, a card with a hole in it. The hole is a dime-sized hole. So the question is, can you pass a quarter through this dime-sized hole without tearing the hole at all, okay? So later on, I'd like you to try this. Try passing a quarter through that dime-sized hole. This goes all the way back to the first slide where circumference is equal to pi times the diameter, okay? So circumference is equal to about three times the diameter, right, okay? If you try to pass your circle through, going through the diameter, it doesn't do it because the, the diameter of the quarter is way bigger than the diameter of a dime, right, okay? But your hint is that the, the circumference is over three times the diameter. Now, for a limited time, you'll also see on top of the card um, a, a place where you can get resources. They're downloadable resources at the following website, ulani.org slash amatic, okay? And, um, and uh, there are PDFs, there are additional resources from which I got all of the information for these slides, and, uh, and um, uh, some other things as well, too. There's a very, very interesting origami exercise that you'll find as well too about how folding a paper, just folding a very, doing a very, very simple fold gets you to something that's very, very unusual circularly, into a circular region. Now, you've, heard, you've probably heard of the Chinese proverb, the journey of a thousand steps begins with the first steps. Okay. There's a similar Japanese axiom, it's this. I'm sure you've seen it before. Enshu ritsu no oku aru keta no tabi wa taisho no hito keta kara hajimaru. Okay? Okay, and it doesn't say a journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. Okay? What it does say is that the journey of a trillion digits of pi begins with the first digit. Okay? Okay? And so I thank you all for inviting me over here to enjoy and share in part of the fun. Uh, a lot of the slides um, weren't, um, weren't included on today's presentation, but they are available in the resource area. Those things that I talked about are in the, in the resource area. So although 
there is no end to the fun in math, okay? I hope that for the last few minutes, you're able to see that we could absolutely replace this by pi, okay? <laughs> There's no end to the fun, okay? Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Jim. That was my reaction when I heard David speak for the first time at NCPL. And then I went back to next year. So he has lots of these things. We'll have to invite him back again and again. Thank you, David. the first time you saw my face in any of these presentations. Thank you. All right. We refer to ourselves as the three Ps. The president-elect, the president, and the past president. And in these odd number of years, the torch gets passed. Typically, in, before we revised the bylaws, it was always passed on the Sunday at the closing. But we don't do that anymore. I'm president until the end of the year, and you're not going to be around at my house on New Year's Eve. So we have a little bit going on here. Well, hey, Stefan wants to be invited to my house on New Year's Eve. All right, so I invite my other two Ps to join me on stage so we can do a little recognition of the changing of the guard. Uh, Rob has been associated with AMATIC for the last, well, Pittsburgh was when? 1999. 1999, he was local events coordinator, Carol. And look at where he is now. <laughs> and I'm chair of the nominating committee, so. <laughs> uh, and he's been VP, conference coordinator, VP, uh, executive director for external relations, and then the last six years, president-elect, president, and past president. I talked to David and Linda jo Gojack from NCPM. They don't do it this long. MAA does not do it this long. Their people are one to one. One year as president-elect, two years as president, and two years as past president. So to be a, an AMATIC president, you have to be dedicated. There's a reward at the end of that path. Rob is going to get a lifetime membership and it is my pleasure to give that to him now. It's my pleasure to welcome Jim now in, a f in 59 more days to the past president's club. Um, we'll teach him the secret handshake a little later. <laughs> but Jim's been a great president and he's done so much for this organization. So I think you should give Jim a big round of applause for everything he's done. <laughs> so it's my honor to present him with his class past president's medallion. Typically in AMATIC, we give a plaque to a person as they are leaving a position. The only exception is as someone moves from president-elect to president. We give them the plaque ahead of time so they have something to display in their office that recognizes their current office. So I am proud to present Nancy Sattler with the plaque that says she is AMATIC president in 59 days.
It has been my extreme pleasure to serve on the board under both Rob and Jim. It has been a real learning experience and I have very large shoes to fill. <laughs> I am very pleased to announce my new board. These officers will become um, in their office January 1st. So we have as president-elect Jane Tanner, past president, if you want to stand and come forward, Past President Jim Wasnowski, Secretary Mary Beth Orange, Treasurer Margie Hobb, Northeast Vice President Ernie Danforth, Mid Atlantic Vice President Dan Ferringer, Southeast Vice President Nancy Rivers, Midwest Vice President Jim Hamm. Central Vice President Nicole Lang, Southwest Vice President Kate Kozak, Northwest Vice President Liz Hilton, and not the least, last by policy, West Vice President Mark Harbison. being your president in 59 days. <laughs> you. Just a few wrapping up announcements. There is still a great conference out there for you to enjoy. The sunshine is there too, but a lot of presenters have put a lot of work into their sessions for this afternoon and tomorrow morning. So I urge you to show your support for the work that they've done. And I've been reminded that tonight we fall back. All right, so make sure you adjust your clocks or you're gonna be early for your session. <laughs> if, we could, if we could have the new board come back up here after everyone's done, we'll do photos and all that stuff. David is going to be with us for the rest of the day and tomorrow, so if you want to talk to him about all the things you know about Pi, track him down. Have a great conference for the next day and a half, and thank you for coming. Excited.